her love.
One, two. Happy?
We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you. Good afternoon and welcome to St. Margaret's as we come together to remember our brother Roger. And um, at the same time, because, um, because of how these events have come, we are very much also remembering Delphine. And it's a chance to bring the families together, um, saying goodbye to Roger on a very cold morning in Guildford in January earlier this year was, was quite difficult. Um, so it's much better that we have this moment now to celebrate his life fully um, and uh, to share memories afterwards of his time with us. But let us begin our service by bringing to mind one happy memory of our time with Roger. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Today we come together to remember before God our brother Roger, to give thanks for his life and to comfort one another in our grief. Father in heaven, we praise your name for all who have finished this life, loving and trusting you, for the example of their lives, the life and grace you gave them, and the peace in which they rest. We praise you today for your servant Roger and for all that you did through him. Meet us in our sadness and fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving for the sake of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for our opening hymn. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this memorial service in memory of our father, Roger, who passed away peacefully on the 11th of January this year at the ripe old age of 90. This was after a relatively short decline following a fall in his garden picking apples in September last year. We're very glad to see you all here today to celebrate his long and happy life. 
As many of you may already know, Dad was born and brought up in Madeira, an island in the Atlantic Ocean west of and belonging to Portugal, which is now a popular de destination for Brits seeking the winter sun and for cruise ships on round-the-world tours. His father and grandfather were both exporters of the famous Madeira wine, and they ran a company called Power Drury & Co. Our grandmother, Marjorie, met her future husband, Charles, on a, on, on a par at a party on board her cruise ship, which had docked in Funchal Harbour. She moved to Madeira and married Charles in the early 1920s, and the young couple had two children, Jill, who is still with us today, but is too frail, unfortunately, to join us, but is represented by our, her daughter and our cousin, Philippa. And Roger, who was three years younger, born on the 15th of February, 1931. Jill and Roger had an idyllic childhood in Madeira, where they lived in an old quinta called Vista Alegre, with a tennis court, grapevines, and banana trees in the garden. They played tennis and swam at the British Country Club and were educated by a governess, while their parents rubbed shoulders with the local well-to-do people, played bridge, and went to cocktail parties. His mother was the reporter at large for the Daily Telegraph, reporting back to London on life in the colonies. They mixed with both fellow expats and local Madeirans, including the Decameras, Isabel and Gonzalo, and spoke fluent Portuguese, although with a heavy Madeirense accent. During the Second World War, when Dad was nine, a large number of Gibraltarians were evacuated from Gibraltar to Madeira. This changed the course of, Mad of Madeiran history, and soon the Gibraltarians were fully integrated into the local community, and the English-speaking Gibraltarian school was opened, enabling Jill and Roger to go to school for the first time. When Dad reached the tender age of 13, the decision was made to send him off to boarding school in England to get a proper English education. So despite the continuing war and the U-boats in the Atlantic Ocean, he was dispatched alone on a ship to Lisbon, which took three days, and then onward on a plane to England, where he attended Charterhouse School and remained for the rest of the war. His school holidays were spent at the home of his godmother, Shirley, and her husband, Basil, and he soon became very close to their son, Christopher, who is watching the service today via video link. At school, he loved playing tennis and cricket and made lifelong friends, including Patrick Atchison Gray, who is also watching via video link and was a wonderful support in Dad's last few months. It was a great tragedy that Dad's father, Charles, died of a heart attack when Dad was only 17. Marjorie remarried to our Uncle Pick and lived out her days in a lovely old house called the Casavella de Casablanca on the outskirts of Funchal, in the grounds of the stately home Casablanca, with her, uh, her live-in, long-suffering maid, Conceição. Mum, Dad, Fiona and I used to visit Granny as a family every second year throughout our childhood, and we have fond, if slightly terrifying, memories of running the gauntlet of the extremely ferocious guard dogs at the Casablanca to make use of their swimming pool. Mum and Dad cherished their connection to Madeira and went there for their honeymoon. They returned there numerous times with various different friends, including their very close friends, David and Colette Arda, who are represented by their son, Clive, here today. They were keen to introduce their friends to Madeira's many delights, including long walks along the Levadas. These are the irrigation ditches that enable the watering of the crops on the steep hillsides throughout the Madeiran countryside, which our grandfather had a hand in designing and building. They also enjoyed adventurous hikes up in the hills above the clouds from Pico Rivo to Pico Arriero, and of course drinking plenty of maracujá juice, or passion fruit in English, as well as enjoying the facilities at the famous Reeds Hotel. After finishing school at Charterhouse and doing his year of national service, Dad went on to train as a chartered accountant in London with the accounting firm Arthur Young, which later became Ernst & Young, and to have a successful career at the paint company Blundell Permaglaze, where he worked for over 25 years. While in London, he shared a flat in Earl's Court with Charles Stileman, with whom he developed a wide circle of long-standing friends through Scottish dancing and the St Paul's Knightsbridge Choir, including Pat and Michael Goodman, the Lunts and the Arders, to name a few which finally led him to Mum and their happy 50-year partnership. It also resulted in a long-standing bridge four consisting of Dad, John Junner, John Lavelle, and Anthony Dawson Paul. Dad's love of tennis, originally forged in Madeira, led to him joining the Hurlingham Club, which became an important focal point of Mum and Dad's sporting and social life since Dad's early 20s, and even more so in retirement. His weekly duels with John Lavelle, who is here today, 
uh, went on for almost 60 years, and there were many familiar faces at the numerous events they attended there, including a trip organized by the club to the battlefields of the First World War, amongst others. Those of you who attended Mum's memorial service in November last year will recall how I spoke about the amazing partnership Mum and Dad had throughout their more than 50 years of marriage. They were so happy together, and neither Fiona nor I can remember them having a single argument. They were so lucky to find each other, and we're very glad that they did. Dad leaves behind him his two daughters, myself and Fiona, his two sons-in-law, Tom and Andrew, and his much-loved grandchildren, Georgia, Jake, Jack and Finn. We're so glad that Mum and Dad were both so fit and well until their 90s and were able to come and visit me in Australia and Fiona in America every year. They were intrepid travellers and took the boat to Boracay in the Philippines, hiked to the Annapurna Sanctuary in Nepal and drove the dirt road to Patagonia in their 70s and 80s. Dad was generous to a fault and was always on hand to pick Fiona and I up from parties no matter where they were during our teenage years. He was also extremely social and would strike up a conversation with anyone, anywhere, anytime. This happened often to Fiona and my extreme embarrassment as teenagers in restaurants, theatres and cinemas. But on further reflection, it was an amazing trait to have and it meant that we got chatting to so many interesting people that we would otherwise not have met. I will never forget Dad doing the circuit poolside at Reed's Hotel in Madeira and collecting a fascinating group of people, none of whom knew each other, to come to a drinks party at our grandmother's house that night. He was a good, kind friend to many, some of whom have been able to make it today and are, atten or att are attending via video link, and a generous and thoughtful host. He was also the driving force behind our family's love of long country walks, striding off into the distance on one of his famous shortcuts, which inevitably led to us getting completely lost and walking twice as far. Fiona and I still love our English country walks to this day. Fiona and I love Dad dearly and will always miss him, but we take some comfort from the thought that he is now reunited with his adored and adoring wife of over 50 years, Delphine. Rest in peace, Dad. Thank you.
Before I start, I'd just like to say, I think if it hadn't been for Delphine, I wouldn't be able to walk up here because she taught me to walk in about 1973 in a flat <laughs> just up the road here in Roehampton. And uh, you reminded me, I also remember running the gauntlet in Madeira and uh, escaping the wrath of your father at 4 a.m. in the morning coming back from a nightclub. <laughs> so uh, here we go. So I'm going to read Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glint on snow. I am the sunlit on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you wake in the morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circling flight. I am the soft starlight at night. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there, I did not die. Please stand for our next hymn. Seated as Jake and Finn come forward for the reading. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Thank you very much. May I speak in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I read an amusing article on the hymn, Jerusalem in the Spectator, yesterday, where the basic premise was, what a glorious, stirring hymn written by the best of British poets and composers, Blake and Parry. But what on earth does it mean? Whose feet are they? Who is this heavenly valet that brings strange trinkets? And why is the bow on fire? The only way I can make sense of it is that the feet belong to Jesus, but the answer to all the questions is a firm no. This, though, is somewhat at odds with the rousing tune, which is better suited to the revolutionary fervor of the second verse. But it's the thing taken as a whole that takes on this uplifting patriotic glow, such that George V insisted If it wasn't in the 1935 Jubilee service, he would whistle it. Singing it today, you can be reminded of Roger's inherent Englishness, despite the Madeira connection. Expats, of course, very often become the most English of the English. But it's also that sense of the glory in the whole thing that we have in coming to this memorial service today. COVID made a battlefield of the world, and the cold winter's morning when just a few of us were present to say goodbye was not the right time to celebrate this long and blessed life. Stepping back from the tremendous difficulties of the last two years and from those last months of Roger's life and some of the difficulties they presented, we can now celebrate the full enviable lives of both these nonagenarians and share the memories that all of you bring here today. I remember, I think it was Fiona saying that she couldn't find a photo of Roger without a drink in his hand. The more I read the Bible, the more a constant refrain strikes me. Do not be afraid. Throughout the whole book, it's the line that comes back again and again. At moments of great revelation, at moments of desperation, uncertainty, in war, in defeat, in old age, in persecution. The voice of anxiety here is Thomas's question, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? It's the natural question for one who has already begun to grieve. Do not let your hearts be troubled. We have the reassurance and the example here of Roger and Delphine's faith, their unwavering commitment to this place. And I hope that their faith will encourage us in the promise that Jesus gives of peace and the promise of a place of rest. The basis of this reassurance is the enduring nature of love. In the wedding service, we're told from the first letter of St. John that God is love. And those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. I always think this verse is more appropriate to the funeral service. It's there that we can really see that enduring nature of love in the children and the grandchildren. Little glimpses of Roger and Delphine. And we know that a force as vibrant and strong and generative and generous as the love that they had for each other for their friends and especially for their family can only find its dwelling place in heaven. Even while shades of it remain here to be found, perhaps in the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in this green and pleasant part of London, and certainly here in this place, which was so blessed with their presence. So do not be afraid. Do not stand at their grave and weep, or at least not for too long. Not when the clouds have unfolded, their bows are aflame, 
and the chariots of fire have raised them to glory. But let us give thanks for the joy that they carried with them and the love that they received and gave. Amen.
Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for Roger, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for all that was good in his life, and for the memories that we treasure today. Lord, hear us. You promise eternal life to those who believe. Remember for good this your servant Roger, as we also remember him. Bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. Lord, hear us. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on all who mourn. Give them patient faith in times of darkness. Strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. Lord, hear us. You are tender towards your children and your mercy is over all your works. Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth to turn to Christ and follow in his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. Lord, hear us. Almighty God, in your great love, you crafted us by your hand and breathed life into us by your spirit. Although we became a rebellious people, you did not abandon us to our sin. In your tender mercy, you sent your son to restore in us your image. In obedience to your will, he gave up his life for us, bearing in his body our sins on the cross. By your mighty power, you raised him from the grave and exalted him to the throne of glory. Rejoicing in his victory and trusting in your promises to make alive all who turn to Christ, we commend Roger to your mercy and we join with all your faithful people and the whole company of heaven in the one unending song of praise, glory and wisdom and honor to be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn.
Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and evening comes. The busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.